demonstrate how partnerships uh, are particularly critical to achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals. The focus of today's session is on the impact that COVID-19 has had on both stakeholder engagement in the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals, including at the national level, and on how partnerships have formed critical responses to the pandemic, and also, we're going to be focusing on looking at what lessons can we learn from experiences moving forward and how can we bring those lessons on to, to tackling other critical issues. Um, during this webinar, uh, you will hear about two studies that have been commissioned uh, by our department, uh, UNDESA. Uh, they will be introduced uh, in order to kickstart uh, the conversations. The first study is entitled The Impacts of COVID-19 on Stakeholder Engagement for the SDGs. And it looks at findings and lessons learned from a survey that was circulated uh, to both governments and stakeholders uh, on their experience of stakeholder engagement during COVID-19. The second study is entitled Partnerships in Response to COVID-19, Building Back Better Together. And it is a study that looks at 36 partnerships that have been formed this past year. The study looks at how these partnerships were initiated, what impact are they having, and what were the enabling conditions that allowed them to be formed with such unprecedented speed. Colleagues, uh, dear colleagues, distinguished participants, uh, the importance of participation by all actors is emphasized throughout the 2030 Agenda. If we have to deliver the SDGs in the next decade, we will need increased ambition, decisiveness, and a sense of urgency. We will need different sectors and actors working together in an integrated manner, including pooling financial resources, knowledge, expertise. Cross-sectoral and innovative multi-stakeholder partnerships can play a crucial role for getting us to where we need by the year 2030. Stakeholder engagement and partnerships are two sides of the same coin. They are closely intertwined. Without meaningful engagement of all stakeholders, we cannot form meaningful and sustainable partnerships. This week is an exciting uh, uh, Right after this webinar at 9 a.m., um, the annual uh, partnership forum of the UN Economic and Social Council will be held under the overarching theme of partnerships as game changer for a sustainable recovery from COVID-19. So that is 9 a.m. Uh, New York time. This forum provides a space for both states and stakeholders alike, and of course the UN development system uh, to look at key issues that are central to accelerating the implementation of the 2030 Agenda and for discussing ways to mobilize new uh, multi-stakeholder partnerships to galvanize actions. This session is webcast by the United Nations uh, through um, the Web TV uh, and it can be accessed through webtv.un.org and I'm asking my colleagues to please put uh, this uh, link in the chat box. And again, we invite all of you to follow the conversations uh, through webcast. Tomorrow, Tuesday uh, and Wednesday, uh, we will have the sixth annual multi-stakeholder forum on science, technology and innovation for the sustainable development goals. And on Thursday, uh, 6 May, the biannual UN Development Coordinator uh, uh, development Cooperation Forum will be held. Again, all of these sessions will be webcast uh, through UNTV, and we invite all of you to follow these important conversations as well. All these events will play an important stepping stone towards this year's high-level political forum on sustainable development, which will be held from 6 to 15 July. I'm pleased to inform you that the program uh, for the High Level Political Forum has just been released and it's available on the forum's website. 
I invite all of you to look at that program uh, and see how you can participate and follow the conversations. And again, I'm inviting all my, uh, my, my colleagues to uh, post the program link um, onto the um, uh, Zoom chat. Thank you so much for your attention. I, I wish all of you a very fruitful and successful conversation today. And let me now hand over the floor to my colleague, Ola Joransson, uh, who will facilitate the meeting. Ola, over to you, please. Uh, thank you very much, Lotta, for those warm remarks and really for framing the session today. So good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everyone around the world. Uh, my name is Ola Jarnason. I um, will be facilitating today's meeting. Uh, I also work in the Division for uh, Sustainable Development Goals in DESA, in LOTAS team. Uh, it, it's very encouraging to see we have a great turnout of participants today. I can see it's about 150 people that have joined so far. I think people are still trickling in. And really by looking at our registration data, it's, it's really a mix of type of stakeholders that are here today from all part of, parts of the world, which is quite encouraging. And also, I think it's also very representational of good and genuine partnerships. So throughout the meeting today, we want to also hear from you. So if you have any comments or questions to any of the speakers or the panelists, please, please use the, the Zoom chat function for that. We have a great team of Lineke, Joy, and Yasmin here behind the, uh, behind the scene that will collect your questions. And at the end of the dialogue, we will post these questions to our panel. So please ensure you also state your name, the organization that you're from, and of course, who the question is for. Uh, we have a great program today, an amazing list of speakers. Uh, unfortunately, the time is not quite as amazing as the speakers. We only have about uh, 75 minutes. So I will really get right into it. Uh, so first off, as Lotta mentioned, we will hear a presentation of two studies. Uh, one is on the impacts uh, COVID-19 has had on stakeholder engagement. And the other one is on how partnerships have formed a really a critical response to the pan pandemic. So I'm quite interested to hear about their findings. So let's first hear from Graham and Emily from the Newcastle University. They have done an extensive look into how the pandemic has impacted stakeholders' ability to, to engage in SDG related activities. Uh, and I'm, I'm pretty particularly interested to hear about any recommendations that has come from this research and if there are any silver linings that you can draw from all of this, is this, for instance, an opportunity to expand and strengthen the, the reach of engagement of stakeholders? But this is, of course, really up to you to, to tell me the findings. So please, uh, over to you, Graham and Emily, and you have about 10 minutes, please. Sorry. Um, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, just a, a bit of a technical glitch. Um, sorry, okay. So yeah, so today uh, Graham and I are gonna be presenting um, uh, the, some of the, the most important findings from our recent report on stakeholder engagement with the SDGs. And as Lada mentioned, uh, our study is based primarily on two surveys that we conducted around October of 2020. Um, the, the first survey targeted stakeholder, uh, stakeholder responses, um, and we had about 478 stakeholders who responded to that survey. About half of those respondents were civil society uh, stakeholders, and uh, the rest were just a mix, uh, were a mix of uh, academic stakeholders, private sector, um, some local and regional governments, and uh, other types of stakeholders. Uh, the second survey targeted uh, government officials in countries that had VLRs in 2020 or 2021. Uh, we reached out to, we got responses from 41 countries, um, but in some cases we had uh, 
we had more than one response per country. So we ended up with about kind of 55 or 60 responses to the survey overall. Okay, so one of the big take home points from our, uh, from our study was that uh, engagement, stakeholder engagement is expected to be even more important um, going forward to SDG processes um, during the recovery from COVID-19. So uh, for our uh, survey of government, of government officials, 68% of the government respondents perceived that the need for stakeholder engagement in implementing the SDGs would actually increase during uh, recovery from COVID-19. At the same time, uh, we saw a real tension here because on the other hand, we asked uh, government officials uh, what they, how much uh, engagement uh, they expected to see from um, uh, stakeholders kind of during this period. And, and they were concerned that across a, a wide variety of types of engagement, they were concerned that, that there'd be uh, less, uh, less engagement from stakeholders because of issues around um, capacity and challenges that stakeholders are facing. So this kind of uh, tension between, on the one hand, this increased need for stakeholder engagement, and on the other hand, the kind of increased challenges that stakeholders are facing in terms of uh, their ability to engage going forward is one of the big themes. So as we said, uh, stakeholders have provided a really key role, have played a key role in implementing the SDGs uh, since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we asked country respondents what sorts of contributions stakeholders had made since the onset of the pandemic. Um, and, uh, and these were kind of a few of the most important contributions that they identified. So facilitating access to particular lo local populations, facilitating the delivery of services, providing financial resources, providing um, knowledge and expertise and supporting uh, the engagement of marginalized groups. We thought it was particularly interesting that 70% uh, so really, uh, a high percentage of government respondents. So that providing knowledge and expertise was going to be a key role for um, stakeholders going forward. And that also supporting the engagement of uh, marginalized groups was gonna be particularly important uh, going forward. So we can see that stakeholders have been really key in providing a number of services for implementing the SDGs since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but they've also faced a number of uh, really big challenges. So we asked um, we asked stakeholders what kinds of challenges they were facing during that period. Um, and we've just highlighted a few of the biggest challenges that stakeholders mentioned. So 57% of stakeholders reported that their ability to maintain or create partnerships would be significantly or severely affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. 65% of stakeholders reported that their ability to ensure the participation of vulnerable or marginalized groups um, would be significantly or severely affected. Again, particularly interesting to think about that in terms of <clears throat> the previous slide on the importance of stakeholders in that role. And 75% of stakeholders reported that their ability to mobilize funds for SDG activities would be significantly or, or severely affected um, by the COVID-19 pandemic. So again, and this is just a sample of the challenges that we face, but really highlights some of the, the very significant challenges um, stakeholders anticipate uh, going forward. Um, so one of the things we were interested in as well is how stakeholder or how countries engaged uh, with stakeholders during uh, the COVID-19 um, uh, in, this, in this kind of context. Um, as you'd expect, countries were using uh, the kind of tools that, that we've all been using. So um, almost all countries had increased their use of online conferencing. Um, there was also quite a lot of use of surveys and um, shared documents and telephone calls. Some countries uh, employed slightly more innovative solutions as well. So um, we saw some partnerships across civil society, state and the private sector, in particular to uh, sort of bridge the digital divide. So to increase um, digitalization and access to digital services. So to get digital services to people who um, perhaps wouldn't have them um, under normal circumstances. So uh, Mexico and Finland were particularly good examples of this. I think Estonia as well. Um, and then we saw some, uh, some countries that really highlighted the importance of engaging at the regional and local level. So translating local ideas and solutions um, then to the national level. So, uh, so Uganda was a, a really good example of, uh, of this kind of engagement at the regional or local level, which might just be a little bit more straightforward um, in the country. Okay, so again, one of the things we were really interested in um, was how the shift to an online, uh, more online engagement might affect uh, the kinds of 
um, the kinds of uh, stakeholders that found it easy to participate. So um, we asked both stakeholders and uh, the country respondents how they expected COVID-19 to affect the participation of different types of stakeholders. Um, and this short, uh, this chart just shows a selection of some of those different types of um, stakeholders. So what we found really interesting here is that uh, really well, better organized um, uh, or, or organizations, stakeholders that are easy to organize like NGOs, local and regional governments and business and industry. They actually anticipated the shift to a lot of uh, a lot of people anticipated that the shift to online engagement would mean um, that it would it wouldn't have any impact on the participation of those groups or it might actually increase the participation of those groups. Whereas uh, stakeholders that might be more challenging to organize um, and have fewer resources, um, so migrants and displaced people, children, youth. Uh, persons with disabilities, uh, it might be, uh, they expected that participation would actually decrease um, from, those, from those individuals. So it's sort of uh, set to hit potentially different stakeholders in different kinds of ways. Okay, Graham? Yeah, thank you, Emily. Um, so uh, I just want to give three forward-looking points uh, to flag from the report, uh, but first a quick um, Clarification. So I think the opening slide said uh, VLRs, uh, we meant VNRs, so Voluntary National Reviews. Um, we're, do we're doing a diff different program uh, of work at the moment on VLRs, and that's kind of where the slip came from. Um, okay, so uh, three kind of uh, findings looking ahead. So the first thing we found was that um, the general impacts of the COVID-19 crisis were reported as falling most heavily on the kinds of mechanisms that tend to promote I guess what we might call inclusive and meaningful engagement of stakeholders. So here kind of ideas, so uh, uh, mechanisms or processes like some efforts to include left behind groups, kind of, for example, kind of uh, by allocating resources to alleviate some of the barriers they might face uh, through kind of supporting long-term mechanisms for partnership creation and kind of uh, continuance um, and through the kinds of processes that support stakeholder involvement and decision-making. Um, so I think there's a kind of a particular challenge arising here around kind of promoting um, quality engagement in these sorts of ways. And then that's in a way not a surprise, it reflects you know, that, that COVID-19 poses a challenge in terms of commitment and attention and funding. And that's what these kind of more uh, substantive processes sometimes need. The second kind of finding uh, is, is interesting is that so it seems clear that, that moving to online engagement has some benefits. So as Emily's laid out, it might be easier to reach certain stakeholder sectors. So it seems easier to hold larger global events like this one. Um, it also seems to allow for kind of easier information sharing and information sharing at the global level again, a bit like this event. Uh, but it also seems to kind of pose challenges around how to involve those kinds of groups that find online engagement especially challenging because of the digital divide or other kinds of reasons. Um, it also seems to, well, I mean, this is something that we didn't kind of find, but I think it's mean that we kind of felt about the, uh, the findings of the report is that we probably think that it posed challenges for the particular kinds of, of uh, deliberation in particular kinds of uh, discussion. So uh, multi-way dialogue and the kind of deep discussion that generates or maintains partnerships, kind of the networking and network building component of um, uh, stakeholder engagement. These things seem like they would be more difficult to do in an online setting and there might be kind of an especial uh, need or recommendation there about developing sort of best practices and the right processes to kind of tackle those specific kinds of challenges that that seem to face uh, more meaningful and inclusive engagement a bit more. So we did kind of some uh, polling on uh, stakeholder, sorry, on um, capacity building and uh, on online engagement, capacity building for kind of meaningful inclusive engagement is one of the needs that came out top in that component. So that's kind of a recommendation to take forward. Uh, Emily, next slide, please. Oh, sorry. So the final points for a finish. Um, so it seems that there were also some uh, impacts on the partnership ecosystem from COVID. And here, I think we, we, we don't quite know, but I think it maybe sets up the next presentation quite nicely to point out that kind of one impact might be on who partners. So how far we see sort of the usual or traditional partners that we've seen in kind of past work around uh, the partnerships, for example, registered on the UN website where NGOs kind of very much at the, seem to be, well, seem to be the, the largest constituents of partners in some of those partnerships. We don't know whether that has changed as a, as a kind of a consequence of COVID. I think where we do see some evidence from our report that things have changed is in the kinds of issues that partnerships are around. So the respondents to our survey saw particular kind of priorities for a kind of current partnerships in response to COVID and also future partnerships coming out of the pandemic in uh, kind of areas that just seem directly most impacted. So 
um, health, uh, digital services, education, these kinds of things. They're perceived as priorities for future partnerships. And it might be that you know, more work needs to go into supporting partnerships in those areas. Of course, it also kind of poses, and this is my final point, the kind of question of which issues or which groups are left behind to a move to these kinds of partnerships. Um, and it might be there's also kind of work to, to be done just to understand the shift or these kind of potential shifts and how it affects the issues that kind of aren't uh, priorities in the same kind of way. So, you know, on our thinking, partnerships follow uh, signals um, and kind of identify priorities and where the funding is and these kinds of things. And it might be that as, as those kinds of signals move towards COVID impacts, I guess it's an important question to consider what might be left behind by that change. And that's it. Thanks. Thank you so much, Graham and Emily. It's quite interesting to hear about this. And I mean, it seems it's very clear that stakeholders obviously are making a significant contribution during COVID-19. And uh, I think it's positive, positive to hear that governments are sort of opening their eyes that the need for stakeholder engagement is more crucial than ever. And I can, it's not so positive, I guess, that you know, there is a mix of results, obviously, to how this has impacted on, on different engagement levels. And I can see that, unfortunately, it seems to have decreased in participation of those uh, most marginalized, which is, of, of course, a negative uh, trend. Um, it's interesting to see, obviously, the moving to online has had a benefit, right? Uh, but what I can see from what you presented is like the deep dialogue might be missing. I mean, it certainly is increasing participation, increasing engagement, broadening it. But the question is if it has this uh, meaningful engagement that we're, we're looking for from stakeholders. And I, I take note that obviously innovations has played a key role in this. And I think that's a good segue to our next presenter the sort of the other side of the coin that Lotto was talking about. So I'd like to give the floor now to Shaolan, who has done sort of a deep dive research into how partnerships were formed during the pandemic, what type of support they did provide, and what the enabling conditions were that allowed them to develop so rapidly. So Shaolan, please, uh, you have the floor, and also if you can keep it to 10 minutes. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Ola. Uh, for the uh, nice introduction and also thanks for having me at this uh, important meeting. So I will share my slides. Uh, I need to have the, the right to, to share my slides. Yeah, okay. Hope you can see me. So uh, today I will present a study commissioned by UNDESA on effective practices of uh, partnerships in response to COVID-19, uh, building back better together. In the past year, despite the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic, the international community has made significant efforts to mobilize partnerships to accelerate the global response, providing urgent health and social economic responses and uh, supporting communities to live with the pandemic, as well as working towards post pandemic recovery and ensuring we build back better. And in particular, during the pandemic, uh, we, have all, um, uh, we have witnessed that partnerships were built up rapidly in just a few weeks or months. And so in this study, we uh, aimed to explore the typology of the range of partnerships, its impact, the formation process and driving forces, the enabling conditions, the challenges they faces and the success factors, and also learned, uh, lessons learned uh, for the future, for other uh, uh, um, uh, responses to the crisis. So for the research, it's a combination uh, of um, first-hand uh, primary case study research and also uh, statistical analysis of collected data. So all the cases we collected using the Google web search and also use experts' recommendation, words of mouth. So it's a combination of methods to collect 
as much as possible uh, of the cases. In total, we have had 36 cases uh, collected, which are newly formed uh, in the past year, in 2020. And uh, out of these 36 cases, we selected nine cases for the interview. Uh, and uh, today, three of the, the uh, nine interviewed um, the partnerships will share with you their experiences, their journey later. And uh, so these uh, nine partnerships cover both domestic and international coverage and cover the various stages of the responses to the pandemic um, and also and the different geographical locations, different continents. And the key findings, briefly to say, is that there is a wide range of partnerships have been formed during the pandemic. And the most of them focus on the Im immediate uh, response to the COVID-19. And uh, these partnerships uh, serve a wide range of purposes from providing financial support and technical assistance, support the project uh, implementation and the delivery or facilitate research and the data collections and the analysis and the coordinate uh, responses to the pandemic. What we have found is the United Nations, the NGOs, civil society and the private sector are all play a key role in initiating the partnerships. Um, why, how they are managed to form the partnership quickly, we found shared sense of urgency pre-existing networks, uh, previous partnership uh, experience, flexibility, and the use of digital technology all contribute uh, to the fast uh, formation. And the vision, trust, alignment of interest, flexibility, commitment, and ad adaptive governance structure and the leadership are key factors, key success factors. They do face challenges. And also uh, uh, the findings suggest there is a need to rethink procedures deemed necessary for formalizing the partnerships. So this is an overview. If we look at the data that we see, looking at the partnership spectrum, most of the partnerships uh, aim to do traditional development better. So nearly 60% of the partnerships are doing the traditional um, uh, uh, development better. And however, we do see around 15%, um, 16% uh, leveraging resources, and also 20% uh, so kind of belongs to the transformational development, focus on transformational development. And look at um, the types. Uh, if we look at it by the, their focus on the different phases of the pandemic, either immediate response or live with the pandemic or build back better. What we find is that nearly half of the partnerships um, focus on phase one, immediate response. Uh, however, we also found um, living, with, living with pandemic, a small proportion and also a phase, uh, phase three, building back better. Uh, however, very interestingly, we found a combination of living with pandemic and phase three, the green color, 22% is kind of living with pandemic and the building better, it covering both phases. So there are uh, also um, quite some um, partnerships kind of covering several phases, um, uh, two or three phases of the pandemic. And then look at who are the initiators, who initiates the partnership. Uh, exactly the, the question that, uh, um, um, you know, the final slide uh, question asked by the previous uh, uh, presentation. What we found, there is a wide range of in initiators, including government, international organizations, NGOs, private sector, the United Nations, uh, uh, etc., or a combination of them. Uh, among all these, we found the private sector and the United Nations are the two uh, largest a group of initiators. Uh, and very interestingly, we see the private sector played a very active role, not only themselves um, uh, alone, but also in collaboration with international uh, organization, uh, with United Nations, with um, national government, uh, and also foundations. 
uh, um, uh, funding uh, agencies, et cetera, uh, to initiate partnerships. And the rapid uh, uh, formation of the partnership, there are several factors contribute to this. The emergency of the nature, uh, emergency nature of the, the crisis, the use of technology to overcome the barriers, especially digital tech, uh, and the adoption of innovative practices in the partnerships. This is in particular we found in the uh, UKRI uh, uh, Newton Fund uh, uh, partnerships and also building partnerships based on trust and the existing networks. This is highlighted in many uh, partnerships and also flexibility. This is another uh, factor widely uh, highlighted, mentioned uh, in our interview. So these are the five major factors lead to the rapid uh, uh, partnering. Uh, can this be replicated for other global crises or SDGs? That's a very important question we brought with our interview. And what we have found um, is that the urgency of the pandemic, the fact that it directly affects many people's life and the rapid and global spread uh, are unique factors that enable quick action. So there are uniqueness uh, in this uh, case. However, one of the interviewees uh, drew a parallel um, to the climate change. And he says that if its urgency can be raised to this level and achieve wide public consensus, quick partnership development may enable positive actions concerning this, as well as other pressing global challenges. So this public kind of global consensus, uh, the urgency uh, to this level may also, uh, you know, if we raise this and this rapid partnership formation may be replicated. And the success factors, uh, in total five success factors. First is forward planning. Um, one of our case studies mentioned, I believe the first success factor is to plan ahead the collaboration. We only took two weeks to plan this um, because we think we have to be quick. Second is trust. Trust uh, was mentioned by all the, the cases uh, we interviewed. And they say partnerships move at the speed of trust. Uh, there may um, already be an existing level of trust between the partners. And this may leave and they many leveraged on their existing networks. The third factor, success factor, is alignment of interest towards a shared vision. This is again a, a factor mentioned by all the interviewed cases. And they start uh, from a basis of existing relationships will help, will help um, uh, the success of the, the, the partnership and uh, a quick formation. Uh, third, fourth is commitment. Uh, the fifth factor is governance structure and the leadership. We also interviewed, uh, you know, international uh, partnerships uh, with a large number of partners. So in, we found that two types of governance structure. One is a joint steering committee based on tra contracts and involve everybody. The second is complex system of existing rules uh, and uh, based on these to guide the partnership. And uh, the partnerships do face challenges. Uh, the top three that, that they mentioned is the uh, uncertainty uh, due to the crisis. They have to deal with uncertainty, unpredictability, and unexpected issues during the pandemic. And secondly, access to key resources. Uh, some started without external or additional sources, and successful partnerships all acknowledged their funding support. They emphasized several times, later Natalie will, I believe she will mention too, uh, the funding support, very important. Um, the, four, the third uh, challenge is communication between partners. Moving online uh, has advantages, but also uh, has some disadvantages, um, cause some misunderstanding, uh, 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 miscommunication, but also has some uh, advantages in saving time, saving travel uh, time, etc. Um, so the enabling factors, um, three main enabling factors. The first is the emergency conditions created by the pandemic pushed all types of institutions to be flexible. Secondly, 
um, the multi-stakeholder model is an important factor for success. And the, this multi-stakeholder uh, partnership model is appropriate uh, to combine multiple resources and uh, use all the partners' social capital uh, to, uh, for success. The third is technology, dig in particular digital technology, uh, um, mentioned by many of the uh, cases interviewed um, as a crucial enabler um, for partnership during the pandemic. And the lessons, my last slide, lessons learned. Um, the lessons learned from this uh, in-depth case study, what we found is that there are some areas of the bureaucracy of organizations, especially governments and international organizations can be modified to accelerate the creation of partnerships. Secondly, is allowing for flexibility. Allowing for flexibility within an organization can generate a fast pro process of partnership creation. It can also facilitate innovative ways of creating and delivering solutions. The third lesson learned is digital technology. Again, it played a crucial role in the communication and the management of modern partnerships and create innovative solutions for them. That's all uh, for my uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shalan, and also thanks to Emily and Graham. Uh, I am struck by learning about how these partnerships that we have from the research and here today, it's quite clear that they represent the force of sort of willingness to get things done. And it's quite striking to see that, you know, organizations and people everywhere are really rolling up their sleeve, sleeves and getting things done. And I, of course, the sense of urgency has led to a lot of this cutting the, some of the red tapes, remove some of the barriers for partnering. And I guess that is the, also the challenge moving forward, how we can learn from this and how we can apply it to other, um, other areas that requires more partnering as, and for the implementation of the SDGs as a whole. So there's certainly some lesson learned to rethink some of these procedures, as you were mentioning. And, but I think uh, this is really great research. And just to remind everyone that both of these studies are on our website, sds.un.org. And I believe they're also being shared here in the chat. So thank you very much to all of you. So ladies and gentlemen, now we're gonna to move to the dialogue part of this meeting. We have five speakers representing five really amazing partnerships. And just as a reminder, please use the chat if you want to comment or send us over any questions. We will be collecting these, and uh, uh, in if time permitting, we're uh, going to post these to the participants, uh, to the speaker, rather. So let me just let me first go to Kenya and invite Florence, who is the coordinator of the SDGs Kenya Forum, which which is a coalition for engaging stakeholders in the SDG implementation in Kenya. Their work has helped the government of Kenya also in their, in their development of the voluntary national reviews, both in 2017 and in recently in 2020. So Florence, if you can please start us off with giving an overview of the work in general of the forum, and then I'll have a follow-up question. And if you can please keep it to, to about two to three minutes, if you can. Over to you, Florence, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ola. I hope you can hear me. Yes, uh, thank you, colleagues. And uh, for the presentations, I think uh, it's a very timely meeting and also very, very good uh, feedback and evaluation in terms of what is really going on uh, at a global level. Yes, uh, my name is Florence Yevo. I come from the SDGs Kenya Forum, uh, which is a coalition of civil society organizations uh, based here in Kenya. And so we have over 400 uh, organizations uh, that are part of the SDG Forum. Uh, majority of these are huge networks uh, within the country uh, that are championing SDG implementation. Apart from that, uh, we work closely with uh, the government, uh, both national and sub uh, national government, that's the county government. And also uh, we have partnerships uh, with private sector, media, academia. Uh, and so for us, we work as a multi-stakeholder approach uh, towards SDG implementation in Kenya. And so we are happy to uh, sort of just talk about our experiences here in Kenya and also to learn from other countries what has been going on. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much, Florence. So I think my question too is, I mean, obviously what were the main strategies undertaken by the forum to facilitate more engagement of stakeholders from different sectors? And I, I'm also wondering, you know, are there any, uh, in the way that you have been working, uh, has that changed anything, any innovations that have sprung up during the pandemic? I mean, obviously is that changed how we work and organize ourselves. So is there anything that you can draw a lesson from that on how you have sort of mobilized stakeholders in the implementation of different areas? Thank yeah, you. thank you, Hola, for that question. And I'd like to start by saying that, of course, uh, COVID-19 has disrupted uh, millions of uh, people, uh, especially in Kenya, but also in many African countries and also in many other parts of the world. Uh, for us, a lot, uh, especially the poor and small uh, informal businesses uh, have really been affected. And so one of the things that we did initially uh, was for us, uh, we've invested a lot in research. And so we found out that, of course, this would be a good way to sort of just uh, uh, keep track of what is going on. And so our initial research was uh, mapping out uh, what civil society organizations in Kenya are doing in terms of uh, COVID response. And so for us, uh, we had uh, very good feedback and that study is available. I could share maybe the link or just uh, later on, if you went to our website, you'd find it there. And uh, we mapped out and uh, you know just had conversations around uh, what kind of activities uh, civil society were, uh, coalitions or engagements of organizations were involved in. And so it was very, very interesting. Of course, uh, there's uh, the response part uh, towards COVID itself. And so we had a lot of organizations uh, uh, supporting production of face masks, uh, supporting, you know, just access to water, uh, also just uh, uh, personal uh, protective equipment. And so there's a lot in terms of just uh, medical equipment also, uh, because for us as a country, uh, we uh, had, the, of course, this crisis, uh, uh, as many countries were not prepared for it, and there was a huge gap, and especially for the marginalized communities. And so a lot of civil society organizations have really been on the forefront uh, to support uh, uh, local communities, and especially those that are left behind. Apart from that, uh, the program uh, quickly convened itself as a, uh, an online platform uh, hub for, for example, women, uh, for groups like the youth, uh, uh, the left behind uh, segments. And so we've been having a lot of virtual conversations and meetings uh, because uh, at least this has, uh, you know, given us uh, the space uh, where we're we not able to meet physically, but we've been able to have online engagements, uh, trainings, and also uh, just uh, conversations at national level, but also so linking them up to global and regional uh, activities. Apart from that, also uh, for us, uh, we've had creative uh, engagements. And uh, for example, we've had two critical uh, uh, memorandum of understanding with uh, a media house, a local media house here in Kenya. Uh, this has not happened before from the civil society perspective, whereby an umbrella body has approached or was approached by the media. And so we are in the process of defining how then can we have uh, you know creative stories uh, told out there, uh, be it on COVID, but also on development and also acceleration of SDG implementation in Kenya. So this is one of the very unique things that we are pursuing currently. And also we also had uh, an, an MOU and also a way of working with one of the umbrella bodies, the Kenya Chamber of Commerce. And this is uh, an umbrella body that is of government orientation, but brings together uh, you know, small enterprises and also citizen uh, to sort of foster uh, issues of uh, um, economic empowerment. And so for us, this has been engaging and also uh, learning from one another and them tapping on the knowledge that exists among civil society organizations. And yeah, so this, there's been a lot that has been going on. And uh, yeah, there are a lot of lessons also learned. And so for us, uh, uh, we've learned that uh, we have to be innovation, innovative. And so there's a lot of mobile uh, engagements and applications that have also been developed in Kenya uh, to respond to COVID-19. There's a lot of uh, you know, equipment uh, development that has also been done by young people, by you know, small businesses. And so this has been very exciting to see such kind of uh, engagements. But again, also, there's been challenges. And one of the challenges for us is uh, civil society organizations. A lot of our funding is very uh, sort of uh, defined in terms of what kind of work. And so when COVID-19 came, a lot of organizations uh, had a lot of needs, but they could not utilize the existing funds. And yet again, also globally, uh, funding for local organizations has not been forthcoming as much. And so there's been a huge gap where there's a lot of needs at uh, the community level, but 
but uh, the, you know, the interventions or the resources are not quite there. And again, uh, for our communities that we engage, uh, the issues of internet connectivity is a huge uh, uh, challenge. And also then people have priorities in terms of taking care of the sick or families. And so this has disrupted a lot of the work that is ongoing. But apart from that, uh, we also have seen positive and very good engagements that are ongoing. Thank you, Ola. Thank you so much, Florence, for that and also for the work that you're doing. It's really amazing to see how through your work you can really capture uh, the energy and all these innovations that are springing up and the, from, you know, the willingness from, from everyone to really get things done. Uh, I take note of obviously there are challenges, I mean, especially around funding now, I, obviously that would be a challenge. And, uh, but hopefully that will uh, that will become better uh, moving ahead. So let me now uh, move, let's turn our focus a little bit further north now to, to Yemen. So um, tragically, even before the pandemic, obviously Yemen faces tremendous hardship and with the collapse of public institutions that provide healthcare, water, sanitation, education, this has really exacerbated an already a dire situation. So uh, learning about the work of the initiative on COVID-19 in Yemen is quite inspiring given the current situation. And this is a partnership that really uh, captures the, the energy and the resources from the full of society. So please, I welcome uh, Mohammed. Thank you for your efforts. And if you can also give us an overview of the situation over there and what the objectives of this partnership is. And again, yeah. I'll follow up with a question. So please keep the first intervention to about two and two to three minutes sure over to you first of all yeah th thank you so much ola um first of all as this has been very very useful so thank you and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today uh, my name is uh, mohammed hayal saeed and i'm here today on behalf of the international initiative on covid 19 in yemen known as iicy now we are a group of like-minded uh, private and public sector organizations seeking to contribute to Yemen's response to the COVID-19 crisis in whatever way we can. Uh, I'm also an advisor at the HSA Group, Yemen's leading family-owned and largest company. Now, as you are all aware, uh, Yemen has faced many challenges. Famine, conflict, natural disaster, the world's worst humanitarian crisis. Six, Long, miserable years have passed since the outbreak of war in Yemen, an eternity of suffering for tens of millions of my compatriots, their families, their loved ones, and their children. Years of violence, fear, hunger, and trauma. A once thriving and entrepreneurial economy has collapsed. A desperate situation for an already desperate people. Now, that's why when the COVID-19 pandemic struck Yemen April last year, we recognize that the new immense challenges would require significant resources and support. And this could not have been addressed by a single uh, organization, not public or private. And so through our charitable organization, the Hayal Saeed Anam Foundation, we acted quickly. And in just three short weeks, we brought together public and private organizations. And that was done even before the first official COVID case had even been reported. So speed was very, very important. And we were very honored to have the participation of our friends at Unilever, Tetra Pak, the Federation of Yemen's Chambers of Commerce, the private uh, sector cluster, and of course, the United Nations uh, uh, in Yemen. Now, these are long-standing partners of HSA who shared our objective to support the people in, uh, of Yemen in their time of need. The situation in Yemen is dire. Uh, and we feared that COVID would push communities to the brink of collapse. The humanitarian crisis is exacerbated by an economic instability, widespread unemployment, and shortages of food, water, and medical supplies. Up until today, the country has lost 150 doctors to COVID. Yet more brave people have come forward to put their lives on the line to save their brothers and sisters. This courage, determination, and resilience are unending. So thanks to the collective commitment we are able to provide support for now and hope uh, for, uh, for the future uh, for Yemen's communities. And we're very happy to be sharing uh, more today uh, uh, in, in today's session. Over to you, Ola. 
Thank you very much, Mohammed, for this update and for the work you're doing. Um, obviously, speed was here a very important factor for getting this work off the ground. So can you give me a, a sort of a, a background to what the enabling conditions were that allowed this partnership to do happen so rapidly? What were the driving forces behind it? Are there, and are there any key factors that you can draw from that were integral, integral to this success? especially factors that you see are unique for this time. That would be quite interesting to hear. So uh, I think a lot of our learnings uh, has been uh, as well uh, uh, mentioned in, in Professor Ayola's uh, uh, presentation. So we believe that with the unity of vision and alignment and purpose, uh, people from different cultures, from different parts of the world with different experiences of working and doing business can achieve great things. Uh, and the impact that the IICY delivered on the ground in Yemen has only been possible to achieve uh, by working in partnership. And so looking back uh, over the past year, we learned a great deal. And, and to be most effective, again, as, as mentioned earlier, decisive and collective leadership uh, is needed. Uh, not only we were uh, very proactive, but our inclusive approach to forming partnerships and recognition on that different organizations were able to contribute in differing ways was essential when forming uh, the initiative. And so by bringing together local and international organizations from both the private and public sectors uh, was very, very, uh, was very, very uh, significant. We believe that including local voices, the private sector is very, very important for an immediate and uh, a more impactful intervention uh, on the ground, people on, on, on the ground, like the private sector have the local know-how, they do have the networks and infrastructure, combine this with the international communities, expertise and resources, and then this, this, this moved and helped move the, the, the initiative very, very quickly. And so transparency and open communication became critical uh, for IICY uh, success. And, and, and it, Again, on, on having an entrepreneurial mindset uh, uh, can create and achieve great things in such a short period of time. And it is because of the nature of the challenges today uh, the world faces that we must come together. Uh, I'm afraid COVID is only one of the tests that our generation will have to overcome. And that's why this UN and Oxford initiative is so important for all uh, the public sector, uh, public institutions, the private companies, small innovative businesses and well established charities, people on the ground and our colleagues in, in Geneva or New York. So these type of partnerships is very, very, very important. Yeah, thank you so much, Mohammed. I mean, and also thank you for um, sort of stressing that that this entrepreneurial mindset is really what we need to get things done. And uh, it's very, it's quite inspirational to hear about the work that you have been doing and how really the openness and transparency led to people and, and organizations coming together and, and do this so quickly. So I hope we'll be able at the end also to come back with some uh, further questions from the floor. But for now, I'd like to continue sort of our global journey here and take us to Mexico. Um, we're a coalition of organizations, uh, which really from all parts of society again, uh, has created much needed need uh, safe havens for women and children. So our speaker here is Christian Skog from the COVID-19 Women and Children Safe at Hotels in Mexico. Uh, Christian, if you can start, us, start off by giving us an overview of what this initiative is all about. And then I'll also following, uh, follow up with a question. Thank you. Thank you, Ola. Uh, hello, everyone. <clears throat> uh, this is Christian Skoog, uh, representative of UNICEF in, in Mexico. Um, so like in many other countries, the, the incidence of violence against women and girls increased significantly um, in the beginning of the, the lockdowns. Um, and this started in, in March 2020 in, in Mexico. Um, in the beginning, we fought uh, a lot to have shelters and, and other specific uh, specialized services to support victims of gender-based gender violence declared as essential services and therefore to remain open, um, which on the whole we succeeded in. But, but many of these services operated with limited capacities and resources um, <clears throat> and, the, and the physical proximity uh, to their abusers 
left many women and girls experiencing violence at even, even greater risk. So together with UNFPA, um, we, we came up with an initiative um, in addition to strengthening the, the helpline uh, services. So this initiative, as Ola mentioned, was, was about providing safe, temporary and free hotel accommodation for women and their children who are victims of violence for a brief period while their cases are studied and different support networks or shelters are, are located. Um, the, the Alliance uh, had um, in many government institutions that deal with, with, with violence against women. Um, the, the two UN agencies, we had a, um, an NGO as, as an implementing partner um, and very importantly, the private sector, the hotel chain Grupo Posadas, which provided the, the, the space um, to, to accommodate this, this initiative or, or these victims. We started in, in five municipalities in phase one, um, expanding to, to six, uh, no, sorry, we started in six, we expanded to seven in, in phase two. Um, the, the women and the children um, are provided with psychosocial support, um, and that also extends to the hotel staff who are dealing with the victims. Um, and and uh, the women and children are also receiving dignity kits with personal hygiene items, uh, sanitary towels, underwear, sportswear, sandals, uh, and, and baby items. Um, the, uh, so far, uh, 84 women and 94 children have found a safe place. Um, they have received psychosocial support, not all the ones who, who needed it. Um, and 300, a bit over 300 people have been trained in the safe accommodation protocol and in prevention of gender-based violence. And almost 10,000 employees of the hotels uh, have participated in, in sessions on prevention of, of violence. Um, like I said, it's, it's a success, successful multi-sectoral alliance, particularly private and public sector. Um, the, the hotel chain Grupo Posadas was, was absolutely you know, essential in this and has begun a non-domestic violence campaign nationwide. Um, and in fact, UNICEF has just signed an, an agreement with an association of, of hotel chains to expand the sector's involvement on, on social issues and particularly this, this initiative. So that's um, largely what this is about. Thank you, Christian. Um, I, I'm wondering if there's any lesson that you can draw from this for future partnering efforts. I mean, it's, uh, I, I hear, I mean, this partnership that you have is really leveraging the power of partnership and including private sector, which is obviously a very crucial element to driving implementation for the SDGs. Is there anything that you can draw from this for um, future partnering efforts in, in other areas possibly? Um, I think many things have been mentioned already <clears throat> um, of, the, of the enabling environment or, and, and, and what lessons can be learned. Of course, existing uh, partnerships should be built on. Um, you have trust, you have confidence, uh, particularly from the private sector. Um, we feel there's many times a lack of confidence between the private sector and the government. So the UN agencies can often work as a bit of a bridge there and, and, and provide confidence from both sides. Um, in, 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 uh, in this particular case, we have worked with the hotel sector before on, on a particular study of the industry's impact on child rights. Um, and therefore, we're, and we're working on implementing recommendations from that study. Uh, so we have, a, we have an existing partnership. Um, the, the, the sense of urgency, um, the, the shared sense of urgency among many actors of, to act um, on an issue such as, as the domestic violence and, and violence against women and, and children um, provides a, obviously an, an opportunity. So I think that's, that's uh, extremely important. Um, the, the, um, the, and and, and the, 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 the CSR part, the, the, the corporate social responsibility part of the private sector is, is very important and they want, they want to help, they want to be there, but they need to um, their, their efforts need to be chan uh, channeled. Um, and I think that's, that's something that we need to have in mind. We need to have in mind that they are, they are, there's a 
big force out there that want to help spe specifically when an emergency type situation arrives. Um, people want to pitch in, and this is this is a this was this was a good opportunity um, in a ne very negative environment, of course, because but but that's uh, that's why we need the, the different alliances. So um, I think those are, are some of the, the key things. Um, of the lessons we, we we still face the problems of funding that that we need to to, to continue and continue to expand this this uh, effort um that's a hard one to crack um because it's not uh, automatic uh, in, in terms of funding some of some of the some of the points i i could share with you Thank you, Christian. Yeah, trust is uh, certainly immensely important to build this sort of collaborations and take it forward. And it seems that the, this shared sense of urgency that we heard about so much, I mean, it's obviously what brings people together, but that is also, I think it allows people more to trust more when you have this very clear common uh, shared vision and also this shared sense of urgency. So thank you very much for, for taking us through that partnership. And now um, let's head back to Africa. We're gonna hear about the experience of the Antikov clinical trial, trial, which also really leveraged the, the power of partnerships and a global network of organizations and researchers to identify treatments for early symptoms of COVID-19 I, I, I think this is an area that is sometimes a little bit overlooked, but it's obviously a very crucial. Not only does it help people that are sick, obviously, but also helps prevent overwhelming uh, fragile healthcare system. So we have Natalie here with us that can take us through this uh, partnership and this uh, journey. So please, Natalie, if you can give us the sort of the elevator pitch on what this initiative is all about. And I'll also come back to you with a follow-up question. Thank you. Thank you, Ola, and, and thank you very much for, for inviting Antikov to be part of this uh, very important discussion. So here we're talking about a, a clinical a research project in health, so slightly different from what we've heard. And the project is in fact a clinical trial and a clinical trial that was aimed very early at identifying early treatment for COVID Whilst everybody was focusing on, you know, preventing mortality, we are considering the, uh, the need for low and middle income countries and uh, low resource settings. We were very much afraid and worried that if too many people would come uh, for, for, for treatment in hospitals, they would not get access. Not all of them would be uh, amenable to receive either oxygen or, or ICU treatment. So we built this project as a pure um, uh, research project. Uh, bringing all partners together. And this is what you do when you do clinical research, you build uh, partners together. But here, there are some specificities. First, this study includes several sponsors. So instead of having like you normally have one sponsor managing a study, we have several sponsors managing the same study. In that same study, we're studying different treatment arms. So it's a very dynamic and flexible design. Um, we have regular interim analysis. We're using new statistics, not you know quite not so often used as Bayesian statistics. And we have been working with the uh, ministries of health COVID response teams very early on to make sure that what we wanted to do was responding to the needs. So our objective is really to reduce the need for patients hospitalizations as a proxy, and we're using uh, uh, oxygen saturation, so very, uh, very objective way of looking at this. We will, we want to test four or five treatments, new treatments that could respond to this. Um, meaning that we need to have probably um, about 3000 patients included in their study about 700 per treatment arm. We are uh, consisting in 26 partners working in 19 clinical trial sites in 13 African countries with 10 sponsors. So it's complicated and we, we defined this as a as a um, um, a management is a, a setup, if you wish, is a, is a consortium of all those members where we make jointly the decisions. So we made them either most, uh, uh, we want to have them 
by consensus, but we also have rules to vote if it's needed. Uh, we have an independent DSMB. We have three subcommittees looking at communication, safety, operations. We have, I said, an independent safety committee. Uh, and we have a community advisory group that are independent to this. And what we've decided is that, you know, there needs to be a coordination at some point because donors cannot have to manage 26 grant, uh, you know, to, to all these uh, all these people. But we work as a team, and so we have this um, this this governance. But within the structure of the consortium, there are different things to do, and different members can take a leading role in this. So um, that's it. I hope I've summarized done the elevator speech. Yes, thank you so much, Natalie. That was uh, <coughs> excellent. So my follow up follow up question to that. I mean, we we heard a lot about this enabling conditions that uh, that led to this successful and rapid partnering. But uh, I am always trying to come back to this. Like, what are the things that we can learn from this? Is this something obviously working with a complicated network of organizations is part of your sort of uh, organizational DNA? But is there anything from this you mentioned that you had uh, this time around, there were several sponsors around the table. Is this anything that you can see that will be applied in the future? And did that uh, lead to well, a good question. better yeah. development? I think in the future, we'll need more and more of these platform trials for big questions like this. It's, it's a new ways of, of studying, which was used in oncology, but we've also learned from the past and this came from Ebola. And in fact, what was learned from Ebola and some of those partners, members of the consortium, they could see the fragmentation that didn't really not help in accelerating the research for Ebola. And I think you always learn from the past. And we know that looking forward, avoiding fragmentation to have solid, you know, consolidated ways of working to respond to this type of question is crucial. And we've seen how when you don't have this, it's also very difficult. And I would say sometimes even detrimental to the generation of evidence. So it, there's a value in doing what we are doing. Of course, the sense of urgency and common goal were the first, uh, you know, enablers. Other than learning from the past and, and wanting to design something that made sense, that included, accounted for the emergency need for science, you know, the, but the fact that science would emerge quickly and we had to adjust from what was coming when we started COVID, we have to remember, not a lot was known on the science. So proactively, we had to think of ways of having a design that would be flexible, but also partners that will be across different regions of the world. We didn't know how the pandemic would evolve. Uh, we didn't know how to account for all other uncertainty. The other thing that helped very much was the early interest from major funders. And I think uh, it was <laughs> mentioned earlier, but it's key. We, and of course the NDI has, you know, we've been, we work like this and we've been working like this for 18 years, but so we, we know a few of the big uh, funders um, and they knew some of our partners too, of course. And they themselves accepted to give us some seed funding to start organizing ourselves. That was very key because it allowed us to take the time, um, even if many worked after hours to, to build this consortium, bring, bring trust, that we had something solid. The trust amongst the partners was already there. Um, we, we, so we got the trust from the funders and we got their interest and solid funding, not, you know, not having to apply to 10 uh, different grant proposals, but to have two or three big ones that help because those are big projects. And so that the fact that funders talk to each other is also a major, the partnerships between funders is very key. The other thing was that when, I, and that was said by others as well, we organically grow within our existing networks. So we have, we have different partners. Our partners in the consortium have different partnerships as well with skills and all of that. And it's this kind of thing that, uh, you know, the mayonnaise grew and we managed to um, make all these pieces of the puzzle together to have one solid project. I think the last thing that helped, and it was mentioned as well, was the way we are governed. Because our governance is, of course, based on trust, but not only. We have this steering committee where we take decisions jointly. We share all information jointly. We can uh, debate things. We don't want anyone to take a leading role, but we, even if, 
you know, some are coordinating, but those that are coordinating, and the NDI is not the only one that's coordinating some of the activities, they decided they are, they proposed. And it's, you know, it's a natural way. I think everybody sees how jointly we, we are stronger. And uh, that's why, because we have uh, the same uh, sense of, of value, which is central, which is still to deliver something for public health. I think all of this is the, um, the probably the recipe for, I hope, success. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much, Natalie. I, I have, I am very interested in this, uh, in this work, and I have, I have several questions, but I, I feel I have to speed on to the next speaker. We'll only have a couple of minutes, 10, 20 minutes left. Uh, maybe there's a round of questions from the floor and then okay, I can try to weave that in. Uh, so next speaker, so another key area obviously that has been severely impacted by the pandemic is the education sector sectors with closure of schools and families having to stay home, work from home. So I would like to finish our sort of journey here with a partnership that has global reach which is the Global Partnership for Education, and in particular, it's uh, COVID-19 response. We have Ian McPherson he here with us. So uh, Ian, please, if you can give us an overview of how your partnership has supported learning efforts in countries all over the world. Over to you, Ian. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Ola, uh, and greetings to everybody. My name is Ian McPherson. I'm a senior education specialist with the Global Partnership for Education, or GPE, where I lead the GPE Knowledge and Innovation Exchange. So who is GPE? Um, with nearly 20 years experience, we support uh, and fund governments in 76 lower income countries to build and finance strong and sustainable education systems that deliver quality learning to more girls and boys, especially those who are marginalized by poverty, by gender, disability, or displacement. We also mobilize and convene teachers, civil society, donors, United Nations agencies, development banks, businesses, and philanthropists, all of whom are represented on our main board behind partner country leadership to finance and support solutions so that no child is left behind. The GP Secretariat is hosted by the World Bank uh, and has headquarters in Washington DC and Paris and an office in Brussels. The COVID-19 pandemic triggered an education emergency of unprecedented scale. Uh, and in lower income countries, which were already facing a learning crisis before the pandemic, 126 million more children were out of school and cut off from school. So as GPE, uh, we mobilized quickly and between April and October of last year, approved 467 million US dollars in COVID-19 accelerated grants to 67 countries that helped governments to sustain learning for up to 355 million children. Our commitment in fact makes GPE the largest provider of funds dedicated solely to education in the global COVID-19 response. In addition, our investments included a $25 million joint initiative to UNESCO, UNICEF and the World Bank to support a coordinated international response to COVID to run for 18 months from May of last year to October of this year. And the principal goal of this grant and partnership is to keep children learning by supporting the development, the dissemination and the delivery at scale of new and existing global and regional learning continuity approaches in GPE partner countries. Its three objectives are firstly, an improved global and regional coordination mechanism, which is led principally by UNESCO. Secondly, learning continuity at scale that reaches the most marginalized, led principally by UNICEF and the World Bank. And thirdly, monitoring evidence and learning and preparation for future emergencies also led principally by UNESCO. Some very quick process points is that the consortium proposal was developed between the 3rd and the 17th of April and approved in three tranches. The first in April against submission of an initial proposal and budget. The second in June against submission of a detailed implementation plan, budget and updated results framework. 
and the third in September against satisfactory progress against the agreed implementation plan for the first two months of operations. Additionally, funds are allocated by the three organizations to a detailed implementation plan and on an adaptive management approach that has been agreed so that the activities funded by the grant can flex to the changing needs of the COVID-19 crisis as it develops subject to suitable approvals for significant adaptations. And the joint technical team reports every two months and a steering group comprised of principals from the three organizations and the Global Partnership for Education provides overall direction and meets every six months. So let me pause there, Ola, and back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Ian. So, yeah, I, I can certainly see the process, how, how this was done. So what I'm sort of also interested in, and was this different from what, how you usually develop partnerships? And again, I keep on asking that, but is this anything that you feel is changing the way you would develop future uh, part, I mean, future initiatives in response to other areas? I think that uh, in my view, that's quite interesting to, to learn mm -hmm. about. And also what you see were those sort of, uh, things that were changed that allowed you to, to make this happen. Of, of course, there's a sense of shared urgency, but any other sort of insights that you can share with us? Of course. Um, maybe before addressing the question, just to reflect a little bit on impact uh, so far, at least. So currently the initiative supports 15 different pilot programs in 45 countries that address different elements of remote learning, including support for teachers, the use of high-tech, low-tech, and low-tech learning materials, parental and caregiver support, learning assessment, and approaches to engaging vulnerable groups, including girls. Uh, and these programs are helping to support hundreds of millions of children to access education and learning. And by way of note, uh, initiative-specific information will soon be available on a dedicated web page that is currently under development. Um, the UNESCO Assistant Director General and Head of Education, Stefania Giannini, uh, reported in the last steering committee meeting that this GPE grant is, and she quotes, a game changer for how the consortium partners works together. Uh, and went on to add that the three organizations are more than the sum of the parts and the impact of this work goes beyond the single purpose of this grant. Further, that this integrated approach is she states a new way of working. And she went on to suggest that the grant informs the thoughts and the discussions about redesigning the architecture of the global education uh, community and the dialogue between the organizations, which is highly strategic, has been greatly influenced by the initiative and has been very positive in terms of outcomes and unlocking innovations. And she also went on to say that there will be important lessons when this project concludes about how the entire community can better work together. And these views were very strongly corroborated by senior leadership in both UNICEF and the World Bank, who suggested that the intense collaboration between the organizations was based on recognizing and being able to leverage each organization's strengths and complementarities. And the result of this is that not only did it break down silos, but it sharpened the deployment of comparative advantages and capacities, particularly at national level, illustrated by, for example, the fact that UNICEF country officers were implementing World Bank programs. So in response to your question, Ola, of what lessons and the question of what was different about developing this partnership, naturally a detailed evaluation would be needed. Uh, and further, it may be both a little presumptuous and possibly premature to suggest lessons for other crises, such as perhaps climate change or ocean protection. However, we can reflect on several issues, including the following. So what did we as the GPE, the Global Partnership for Education do? Well, firstly, we did not specify exactly how regional and global efficiencies to continuity of learning should be achieved, but rather put it as a challenge to our partners to respond to. And so in this regard, we were not prescriptive. And in response, partners were able to leverage their best work. 
And the ontology of the GPE as a multi-stakeholder partnership seems to matter here, i.e., is it only a partnership constituted by a range of constituencies and funded by a myriad of organizations and institutions and therefore less fettered by political, financial and technical dynamics than single institutions that is able to pose such a challenge to the global community? Secondly, our board agreed to reduce some of the transaction costs of customary grant processes. To have a proposal developed and approved within two weeks is frankly unheard of. Yet we were able to retain rigor and fidelity to the challenge at the secretariat level by approving the grant in three tranches. We therefore accepted a higher degree of risk yet allowed work to begin quickly with further development, refinement and demonstration of impact to trigger subsequent, uh, subsequent tranches, which is also novel and innovative in terms of working. And then the final point is what did the partners do? Again, more information would be needed, yet we know that the consortium was immediately committed to both working together to reduce transaction costs and maximize efficiencies and to work with each other. And this has been mentioned several times over the course of this discourse, the urgency of the crisis perhaps highlighted how institutional politics create silos. And in this sense, the crisis nurtured a hive mind response as demonstrated by the ability of this partnership to develop a division of labor based on comparative advantage and the synergistic leveraging of each other's architectures, infrastructures, and resources. And in this regard, the whole is truly greater than the sum of its parts. Let me pause there, uh, Ola, and come back to you. Thank you so much, uh, Ian. I, I wish we had more time, but unfortunately, we're running very close to eating into the partnership forum, which starts at nine. So at this point, we will move, we'll, we'll take one or two questions from the floor that we had gathered. But thank you very much to all the speakers. This has been quite a learning experience for me and I hope as inspirational for others also as, as it has been for me. It's quite uh, really remarkable to see how quickly organizations and people have come together and stopped, stepped up to deliver quickly and focus people's mind, eliminating unnecessary bureaucracies and politics to really get things done. I, I'm just gonna pose two questions and they are, one is for Mohammed, and the other one is for Natalie. So for Mohammed, uh, if you can please elaborate what type of interaction and support IICY had from the Ministry of, Ministries of Health or other ministries and NGOs in general, and in which, which areas location-wise did IICY work? And for Natalie, I'm, I'm asking at the same time. So you can think about that. So for Natalie, the question is on, the impacts of this um, developing these uh, medicines and these trials. If there's, you can talk anything about what the impact that had and what type of uh, support were actually uh, given at the end. So I see, unfortunately, these were anonymous questions. So please go ahead and if you can keep it to just very sharp one minute answer, please. So Mohammed, over to you. Yeah, thank you. So very quickly, the, the objective was not to replace the public health authorities. Uh, the objective was to assist them to amplify the work they're doing on the ground. So uh, the way we worked with the public health authorities, they were able to give us the required shortages and the gaps on, on, on the, in the health centers and the overall uh, shortages the, uh, the health sector is facing. So that's that included ventilators, that included uh, the PPE. So the the these information was so vital for us to be able to assist the public health authorities. So there was a very strong collaboration between the IICY as well as the public health authorities. Now, in terms of what areas we covered, we covered across the whole country and depending on the magnitude of, of, of the cases reported. So some parts of the country had way more cases versus other parts of the country. So we were guided by the WHO and guided by the public health authorities, and they were responsible for the distribution of these to the healthcare centers. Thank you so much. And over to you, Natalie, on the impacts of these medicines. 
Thank you, Ola. It's a difficult question. I think the first thing is that we, we showed and that, you know, LMICs still have need and they can work together and we can, we, we need to show that there is a need there and it's it's feasible, very feasible to bring the best expertise to respond to questions. The other thing is, I think for the countries, for us, um, we're building new networks and this is work to be developed, but we can already see that there are new connections that will be maybe setting the ground for future larger needed projects. And that's very key. The last thing I really liked what was said before about working differently, learning on our practices on limiting bureaucracy and showing that, you know, sometimes maybe when you're working in urgency, you get rid of some of the superficial stuff, you focus on the essential. And that is uh, something to be developed and to be continued, I think. The last thing I would like to say is we're trying to find treatments to limit severity progression. We still haven't finished. We're just, you know, restarting the study. So I'd be happy to come back and, and, and provide, you know, a real response on the impact, which is to treat patients early. Over. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Natalie. And really thank you to everyone for being part of this to the speakers, to the panelists, and also to the participants for, for tuning in and listening. Uh, we have now come to the closing segment. I hope this has been inspiring for me and educational uh, as it has been for me, for you. And on a, just on an end note before we hand over to our closing uh, reflections, um, we do run a number of these webinars on different aspects of partnerships about every two months and with a high level political forum on sustainable development coming up in July, there will be a series of uh, events, learning and capacity development activ activities. So please stay tuned on our website for that. For that. And of course the ECOSOC partnership forum is starting in three minutes. So you can shift over to that uh, if you have time to um, tune in. It's gonna be quite an interesting meeting, I think. So now I will hand over First, to our resident stakeholder engagement expert and my dear colleague Nayar to give some reflection and please keep it very brief. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Ola, and thank you to all the panelists for this has been really enriching. I'll be really, really brief. Uh, I'll just start with what Lotta said at the very beginning, that stakeholder engagement and partnerships are the two sides of the same coin. And I think this was clear through the presentations. It was interesting this how the sense of urgency was the catalyst of a lot of uh, the partnerships that we saw today. The Antikov in Yemen, or also Mexico, uh, but also the sense that we will need more. We will need more and more diverse partnerships, and this was clear in the report that Graham and Emily uh, shared. Interesting also was how when you have pre-existing networks and mechanisms, these trigger partnerships quicker. And the uh, experience that Florence shared with us from Kenya was really important in, in this regard. And now I think what we are doing is this reflection from immediate uh, response to long-term collaboration and how can we build on this? And my, my final thoughts is that we, we have new solutions. We need to register more on these new solutions. We cannot be complacent to see that, oh, it's such a huge challenge and how can I engage stakeholders if I can't put people together? There are solutions coming, but we need to register more. We need to learn more. We need to create more capacity, including, for instance, on the online. And I think we will also need to start uh, to need to develop tools to review the quality of the in stakeholder engagement and partnerships as well. And I'll leave uh, the link to, to uh, a framework we developed that can support on the stakeholder engagement side. So I think there's a lot of work to do, a lot of reflections. And thanks so very much again, Ola, and uh, also inviting everybody to come to the Partnership Forum and also tomorrow to the SDI Forum. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Nayara, and certainly meaningful engagement is really the uh, what I take away from that. I think that's really what we need. So Quickly over to Darian. Of course, Darian is the executive director of the Partnering Initiative and also our implementing partner partner of the 2030 Agenda Partnership Accelerator. So over to you, Darian. 
Thanks so much, Ola, and what a, a great session. I will leave you with just a few words. And the first thing is, is the word is optimism, that we have seen that in COVID-19, every sector brought resources to the table. They all acted, and in many cases, acting through collaboration. The other thing we've seen is that we transformed overnight the way that we were living, the way that we were working, which means there is the potential for the transformations that will genuinely be required if we are going to meet the SDGs. And we've seen that partnering can happen quickly. We can cut through the bureaucracy if we have the we heard about the donors funding in different ways, if we can develop partnerships far faster to meet the, 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 the absolute desperate need for collaboration quickly for climate change, then we genuinely have an opportunity here. So the old African proverb of saying that if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. The reality is we have to do both. We have to go fast and we have to go together. I think COVID-19 has shown that we can do that. And therefore, as I said, optimism is the key word moving forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Darren. And that's exactly what I'm going to do now, go very fast. And together with you all, thank everyone, all the speakers and participants. Uh, we hope to see you again. And uh, over now to the partnership forum. Thank you so much. The meeting is adjourned.